we'll be doing anglo-saxon prose as i told you we'll be continuing rather so uh, let me present the screen to you Okay, uh, can you see the PowerPoint PowerPoint presentation? Yes. Okay. So, and just uh, let me uh, just go over the previous uh, slides. As you know, we were discussing the achievement or the contribution of Elfric to uh, Anglo-Saxon prose. Now. Uh, so we have done that portion. So now let us move on to King Alfred. King Alfred's contribution to Anglo-Saxon prose. So King Alfred uh, is a very well-known, uh, renowned name. His name is a very famous one in the political history of uh, the Anglo-Saxons. Uh, he was uh one of the kings of wessex the, the portion of england which is now called wessex and he ascended the throne in the year 871 so uh, just a few words about alfred so he ascended the throne in the year 871 and uh, in the initial uh, years of his reign, he was engaged in fighting with the Danes. With the Danes, so uh, it was a very kind of a busy uh, time for him. As you can uh, well understand, he was engaged in fighting and he could not uh, sort of engage himself any in any kind of literary activities and in 878 uh, in 878 he then uh, finally made a treaty uh, with the danes and this treaty is very important it is called the treaty of wedmore w-e-d-m-o-r-e -E, the treaty of uh, wedmore and with this treaty that uh, king alfred concluded with the danes uh, peace returned to england there was a kind of a temporary peace between the danes and the anglo-saxons and then alfred began to concentrate on the spread of education so now he could get some time as he was no longer engaged in uh, sort of you know uh, fighting with the Danes he could pay attention to uh, education So now we can uh, we can see that how Alfred wanted to remove ignorance. He wanted to remove ignorance uh, from the minds of his subjects, and that was his primary objective. So, uh, with this objective in mind, he decided to translate he decided to translate uh, a number of important latin works into english and you will see that uh, we have mentioned uh, already we have mentioned one important latin work uh, which was of course written by uh, bede the ecclesiastical history of the english nation so I'll just uh, give you a list of these books which Alfred and his uh, associates translated from Latin into English. First was the 
ecclesiastical history of the English nation. That was by Bede. The second one was uh, Pope Gregory's uh, Cura Pastoralis. Cura Pastoralis. C U R A P A S T O R A L I S. Cura Pastoralis. This is the Latin title uh, translated into English. It would mean uh, it would mean the shepherd's book. The shepherd's book. So uh, in that way, it was sort of uh, the first kind of a translation, a translation that he undertook. And uh, now uh, there is one thing that I would like to tell you that uh, that relates to the fact that King Alfred uh, was not very well conversant with Latin. He was not, a, of course, a scholar like the monks. He was not a Latin scholar. So when he decided to translate these Latin works, he actually took the help of a number of uh, monks or uh, scholars who were uh, well versed in Latin. So people who knew the language. Now, uh, that is why uh, we find that some of the works have been translated by him and some were translated by the people that he had employed. Now let us uh, come to the third book, which, which uh, Alfred commissioned for translation. And that is uh, The Consolation of Philosophy. The Consolation of Philosophy by the Italian philosopher named Boethius. Uh, Boethius spelling is B-O-E-T-H-I-U-S. Boethius is Consolation of Philosophy. So that was the third book which Alfred commissioned for translation. The fourth one was The Compendious History of the World. The Compendious, C-O-M-P-E-N-D-I-U-S. The Compendious History of the World. As you can well understand, it's a history. It was written by a Spanish monk, a Spanish monk named Paulinus, uh, sorry, not Paulinus, Pauli, uh, Paulus Orosius, Paulus, P-A-U-L-U-S, Orosius, O-R-O-S-I-U-S, Paulus Orosius. So he was the writer of this book, The Compendious History of the World. And the last and the fifth text, which Alfred translated or he instructed his uh, Latin monks to translate was the Soliloquies. The Soliloquies, S-O-L-I-L-O-Q-U-I-E-S. S-O-L-I-L-O-Q-U-I-E-S. The Soliloquies of Saint Augustine of Hippo. So uh, Saint Augustine was this monk. Uh, actually, in those days, uh, people were designated by the places they came from. So this person, uh, this monk rather, uh, he is known as Saint Augustine of Hippo. So uh, uh, actually there is a, his uh, name is a bit uh, complicated, his Latin name, but uh, in English he is known as Saint Augustine of Hippo. He was uh, in the 40, uh, 4th century. So he lived in the 4th century and he wrote this book, The Soliloquies. So we'll be dealing with these books one by one. And before that, let us go to the this PPT, PowerPoint presentation. So after his victory against the Danes, Alfred, who was a wise king, uh, set himself to the task of uh, reanimating and reconstructing his people who had sunk into the depths of the barbarism. Just one moment.
কি বলছো তিনটে অবধি ঠিক আছে so uh, let us continue mm. so uh, as we have mentioned that uh, alfred's purpose was to uh, reconstruct or educate his people so who had sunk into the depths of barbarism and, and ignorance and to make them orderly disciplined cultured so he had this objective in mind he devoted himself uh, this should be wholeheartedly not who wholeheartedly uh, so wholeheartedly to improve their literary ideal and intellectual and cultural standard of uh, standard so as we see that it was uh, the endeavor of king alfred to make his subjects more cultured and educated so that they might be able to read uh, in their own language english those important latin works so uh, that was the reason he took up his uh, his pen in order to write uh, do these translations so first let us look at uh, we have already looked at Bede's uh, ecclesiastical history of the English nation. So what what is there uh, in that book? So we know when I was doing Bede with you, I had uh, discussed the contents of the book. So I'm not going into that particular text again, uh, but I'm going to uh, look at the second text that is Cura Pastoralis or the Shepherd's book, which uh, is, uh, was written by Pope Gregory. So, uh, in this, in the preface, in the preface, uh, uh, which in Bengali is called uh, Bandho Jeta Ke Bale Arki, just uh, before the uh, before the main body of the work. So he, uh, Alfred, King Alfred, has very clearly stated his objective. Uh, what he wanted to do so uh, i am quoting from the preface uh, and he says quote i began among many other varied and manifold businesses of the kingdom to turn that book into english unquote so he had many other works as a king of course he was extremely busy but it is really remarkable how he still found time to sort of take up these translations sometimes he did them himself and sometimes he sort of uh, took the help of latin scribes so as we know the king had a, a limited knowledge of latin and uh, the difficult passages were omitted so if he could not uh, fail to understand any of the passages he simply uh, omitted them uh, the other passages were translated as he understood them and not as they were there so alfred since he did not know very good latin he had to sometimes omit certain passages which appeared to him very complex and sometimes he uh, whatever he understood he sort of put it down uh, the translation was made like that so the works became well known to his uh, people uh, when they came out and uh, of course the some flavor of the original works original latin works were there and he for this purpose of translating these latin words works into english he also of course consulted a body of scholarly monks and he selected five texts as we have already said so in this preface that this preface is important this preface to cura pastoralis is important uh, because of uh, alfred's sort of as you know uh, as we see 
how he uh, what he wanted to do and that he has sort of presented before us so uh, let us look at this text uh, uh, in detail now so cura pastoralis uh, written by pope gregory uh, he, whose dates are 540 to 604 AD. Uh, he was, Pope, uh, Pope Gregory was one of the most eminent clergymen in Rome. And uh, he was a good administrator. And uh, it was Pope Gregory who sent uh, Saint Augustine to England in 597 AD. As we you already know, that Saint Augustine arrived in England in AD 597 to uh, preach Christianity. So uh, Pope uh, Gregory, actually, as you know, England was under the rule of uh, the Roman rule, and once in a Roman marketplace, uh, Pope uh, Gregory saw some anglo-saxon slaves and he found them to be very uh, becoming and handsome so he uh, he writes that uh, he felt that it was fitting that the praise of god our creator uh, should be sung should be sung in those distant parts so actually we uh, get to know this from Bede's account Bid's account, what he has written in his book. So, Alfred, when he took up uh, this particular work, he was uh, his approach was uh, purely uh, educative. He was not concerned with doctrinal or religious disputes. He was uh, kind of. Uh, trying to spread uh, education. So, uh, as we see that uh, in this book, there is uh, this, uh, these instructions are there. And these instructions are meant for bishops, clergymen, and other religious people. So, uh, they're actually meant for people who are in the religious order, cura pastoralis, or pastoral care. It is translated in like this also, pastoral care, or the shepherd's book. So uh, this is uh, this book is based on a, a key concept, and that is quote the art of arts is the care of souls. The art of arts. Is the care of souls unquote so the care of souls so obviously uh, not caring for the body but for the soul so the heavenly soul which would ultimately uh, be united with God after death so obviously one had the responsibility one had the task of uh, enlightening oneself uh, to purify one's soul so, King Alfred mentioned that uh, he found the Cura Pastoralis a uh, most suitable book for instilling wisdom into uh, uh, men both in church and state. So, uh, this book appeared to uh, King Alfred to be a very suitable book for translation. And therefore, uh, he omitted very little from the original original book and uh, almost the whole book has been translated by King Alfred so this was uh, this is uh, as we see uh, the translation uh, I'll just mention the preface uh, once more because this preface is very important this is quite famous and here actually alfred gives us the reasons why uh, the reasons and the methods that he would uh, adopt 
to present his translation to the public. So firstly, what he does, he laments the decay of learning from the age of Bede, which was full of eminent Latin scholars. So he is lamenting the decline of learning, that learning had, has declined since the time of Bede. And he now uh, sort of enumerates a catalog. Uh, and uh, there he speaks of the devastations of the invaders, especially the destruction of the churches, the monasteries, which were once filled with books. But as he now laments, there is little stimulus for learning. So people are no longer inclined towards uh, learning or getting the knowledge. So uh, that is one factor that he feels very sad about. And the second thing is that what he writes in the preface that the Greeks and the Romans had translated the Bible into their own language. So the Bible actually was originally written, uh, it was in Hebrew, as you know, it was written in Hebrew. And uh, it was translated into Greek and Latin later on. And uh, so the Latin scripture uh, stories, which were there, uh, had not been translated into English by anyone. So Alfred felt that if such a translation was done, uh, then the young people and uh, readers of the next generation, they would have, uh, they would be benefited immensely. So that was the second purpose of King Alfred in choosing this work. Thirdly, uh, in spite of many kingly duties that he had, he spent time in translating this work, uh, sometimes word by word, sometimes meaning by meaning. So, as you can see, this is an important work which Alfred translated, Pura Pastoralis. So that, that is the second book. So now let us come to the third book. Uh, I will go to the PowerPoint slides later on. Uh, I'll just, uh, just mentioning these books which uh, Alfred had translated. So the third book is, as we had mentioned, uh, the Italian philosopher Boethius's book, Consolation of Philosophy. And uh, this is perhaps the only book which is uh, definitely literary in character. So uh, Alfred thought that he should translate this book and he felt that knowledge and skill would be gained and uh, in uh, translating this book. So uh, as we see some of the uh, important uh, passages uh, I'll just tell you but who was Boethius? So we need to know that uh, he was a cultured and wealthy Roman. He was born around the end of the fifth century, that is around uh, uh, in 510 AD, he was made a consul and a member of the Roman Senate. But in 522, he was arrested and he was uh, charged with attempting to put the power of the Senate above that of the then Emperor Theodoric the Great. So he was uh, imprisoned and this book was written while he was in prison. So uh, this is actually uh, a kind of a poem written in like that, the form of a poem, 
and uh, the form of this poem is uh, kind of a, an unusual one though uh, alfred has translated it into prose of course so now boethius had conceived philosophy as appearing as a beautiful maiden and uh, rebuking him uh, so, uh, so as you as you see here that uh, philosophy takes the form of a beautiful maiden and she appears before boethius when he's there uh, in the prison and she is rebuking him for forsaking philosophy for forsaking learning that is and uh, she also comforts him with uh, with a kind of a discourse uh, on true happiness what constitutes true happiness and the relationship between man and god so uh, as we see that boethius though he was uh, probably a christian but his philosophy is full of pagan and classical allusions and there are references to the uh, great greek philosophers like plato aristotle and references to greek legends are also there so uh, he had a reputation for wisdom and scholarship boethius actually so in this book the discussion continues uh, the uh, relating to the relationship between man and god and boethius's book was translated into several languages so after king alfred had translated this work chaucer translated it into middle english and uh, even queen elizabeth the first during uh, during the renaissance she is attributed uh, to translate has translated some of the passages so uh, in the introduction uh, alfred gives us the historical background of the book and uh, he describes how theodoric who was the king of the goths uh, the goths were as you know one of the germanic tribes and uh, this person theodoric he succeeded to the kingdom of rome and uh, at first he had promised the roman christians peace but later he started to uh, persecute them and kill them so uh, and uh, Boethius, of course, he, uh, as, as we see that, uh, not Boethius, but uh, Pope, uh, when, the, when the Christians were being persecuted, uh, Pope John, uh, he, he began to write letters of protest on behalf of the Christians. And he was imprisoned. And uh, in the end of or beginning of 525, he was put to death. So. Uh, that uh, was the kind of uh, fate that uh, Boethius had. Now, uh, there are actually four or five sections in this book uh, where there is this discussion with philosophy and where uh, we also have the figure of fortune who comes and she offers Boethius gifts but uh, philosophy, of course, uh, asks Boethius not to accept those gifts because those are temporary in nature. And uh, there are explanations in terms of Christian doctrine and all that. So the relationship between man's free will and God's foreknowledge is, of course, uh, it forms one part of the discussion in the fifth section towards the end of the book. So man is looked upon as a free agent. He is free to do whatever he likes, but uh, he also is subject to God's uh, omniscience. So God knows everything what man is going to do, but he has given man 
full freedom to act according to his wish. So here uh, in this book, we see how the discussion continues and it closes with philosophy's assurance to Boethius that God will reward those who sacrifice themselves for him. So Alfred actually adds this part and Alfred offers this as a kind of moralizing and didactic work. So didactic meaning a kind of thing that is uh, meant for instruction. Kono shikha mulak, kono arki lekha. So actually Alfred wanted to educate his people. Shikha dan gurte chai chilen, tar proja der. Shri jonna tini ai boita translate korlen ebang he offered it as a kind of a moral a didactic work. Jekhane bola achhe mane what you should do as a Christian. So uh, this is the actually in short this is the book which Alfred translated Boethius is uh, of course this book. Now uh, let us move on to the next one which is the compendious history of the world by Paul Sorosius and uh, who, uh, who was he? He was uh, the 5th century Spanish priest and uh, this book is actually dedicated to his mentor uh, saint augustine of hippo uh, whom we uh, whom we will be discussing later on so saint augustine is remembered for two very important books one is his confessions as you know Confessions, which was translated by Alfred, and the other is the City of God, where he has contrasted Christianity with uh, other religions. And here also, uh, the main uh, content of this book is that uh, Orosius begins with a survey of the early history of the world. There are vivid accounts of the wars, fires, earthquake, different types of diseases which befell mankind. Uh, especially there are the reference to, references to different wars which took place. So the descriptions of the conquests by different tribes, those are there. And uh, there is a kind of a line in this book which comes again and again, which is kind of a refrain, R-E-F-R-A-I-N. A refrain is a, a recurring a kind of a line which can be found in a book or a poem. It is a fide fide ashche. And that is, uh, quote, think on those times and then on these and see which is to be preferred, unquote. So, Actually, Orosius, what he was doing? Orosius was uh, relating the history of the world, or kind of, because it is a compendious history of the world. He was referring to those pagan rulers who had, uh, who had been very cruel, who had killed so many people in wars. And uh, he contrasts this with Christianity, the uh, sort of, influence of Christianity, the purifying influence of Christianity. So that is his purpose to sort of glorify Christianity and why one should uh, embrace Christianity. And you will find uh, a number of, uh, so this is also a kind of a didactic work, a moralizing kind of a work. So a number of digressions are there. Uh, some passages have been inserted, which are not by Orosius, perhaps. And you will find here, there are Alfred's own, own proverbs and maxims. So one of the proverbs or maxims is, quote, a day on which no good deed is done is wasted. So, uh, unquote. So 
this is uh, one line which Alfred uh, wrote here a day on which no good deed is done is wasted so uh, this is what actually Alfred uh, translated this book Orosius's uh, compendious history of the world and uh, the last book we, we, we have come to the last part of Alfred's translation uh, of course there is the anglo-saxon chronicle which uh, i'll be doing in the next class uh, as you see there is uh, this book the confessions which i was mentioning book number five which alfred translated uh, no sorry not the confessions but the soliloquies of saint augustine the soliloquies of saint augustine and he was a fourth century monk as you know and this book is actually in uh, two parts and alfred translated the first part of this book of this series of books two books and you will find that uh, uh, in the first book there is uh, a kind of an inner dialogue there is a conversation where a number of questions are asked a number of uh, questions re uh, which relate to kind of uh, religious matters and those uh, discussions on religious matters are to be found in this particular book and discussions go on the dialogues are there the questions are asked and the answers are given so it is in a dialogue form someone is asking questions and another person is answering him so it is in this form and it ultimately leads uh, to the kind of a question uh, the fact that Augustine is looking for an answer to self-knowledge. So he wants to attain or gain self-knowledge, to know oneself. So that is, of course, a very difficult task to know oneself. But St. Augustine here is engaged in doing exactly that. And in the second book, you will find that uh, St. Augustine in the first book was concerned about knowing his own soul his own self and in the second book you will find that saint augustine actually makes it clear that the soul that he is uh, trying to uh, know about gain knowledge about is his own soul so it is his own soul that he is concerned with so uh, obviously as we can see that these are the translations of the books the five books that alfred had chosen and uh, his objective what was his objective we have already seen so uh, in the next slide i will just uh, say that uh, obviously uh, King Alfred's contribution to the development of Anglo-Saxon prose is marked in a threefold way. Firstly, he helped the development of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which we'll be doing in the next class. I'll just tell you something about the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, its importance. Or simply the Chronicle, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, or it is called simply the Chronicle, which was the first true specimen of the anglo-saxon prose and secondly he initiated and encouraged the english translation of certain great latin works as we as we saw these five books thirdly he himself wrote and thereby contributed to the growth of anglo-saxon prose so he himself uh, started to translate though he did not know a very good latin still he was enthusiastic enough to undertake the translation he did not uh, just stop by 
and sort of commissioning these translations to the the learned uh, people now before uh, alfred the anglo-saxon chronicle actually i'll just uh, give you a, read this portion uh, now we come to the anglo-saxon chronicle i'll uh, do it i'll give you some of the quotations from the anglo-saxon chronicle which you can just uh, write down uh, but let us uh, read this uh, ppt what is written there that before the time of king alfred the anglo-saxon chronicle was nothing but a loose and detached record of the birth of certain kings and the history of their warfare so it was a very dry account it had nothing uh, literary in character so when alfred took it up for a sort of you can say a revival it, it met with a revival in alfred's hands it was alfred's sincere efforts and spontaneous enthusiasm that immensely contributed to the growth of the anglo-saxon chronicle as the first monumental work of english prose so it is regarded as one of the monuments of anglo-saxon prose alfred was supposed to have written some portions of the chronicles but what more uh, he did was to raise the form uh, formless chronicle to the immortality of the first national history of a western nation in its own language so it becomes in his hands a record of the national history of the English people. So it was fully transformed. The considerable part that Alfred played in the literary movement of the time is most singularly marked in his laudable enterprise, that is praiseworthy enterprise, to translate their classical works which seemed to him apt to civilize and improve his people. So we already know that what he was aiming at to improve uh the quality of the english people to civilize them to educate them Bede, a great scholar of the age traced the history of the religious development of england in religious literature of all ages so in his ecclesiastical history of the english people, nation his importance is an admitted fact by bringing out the translation of Bede's work alfred tried to instill into his ignorant people the truly christian morality so uh by translating Bede's work, of course, see Alfred tried to do that, the true Christian spirit. That was what he tried to instill into the hearts of his subjects. And by reviving the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, he was more uh, desirous of sort of, you can say, bringing to the forefront, bringing to the forefront thus, uh, this history the history of the english people and how it was when he was kind of uh, what he was doing was making the anglo-saxon chronicle a very important document a very important document which would sort of uh, be a national history it would be a record of the national history of the English people and it would provide a lot of uh, information valuable information to the later uh, writers later scholars who would study the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle so from a dry and drab account it became quite uh, an important sort of work 